regards to the Noahide laws, this is a this is the and the Torah and so on. This is the, uh, the explanation. The uh, Gemara in Masechet Chagiga, the tractate of Chagiga, says that Hashem wrote the Torah with black fire on white fire, 974 generations before creating the world. And then he looked at the Torah and created the world based on it. Meaning, he saw that there are, let's say, for example, kosher laws, so therefore he created kosher animals. Uh, he saw that there is a um, uh, different uh, aspects of the Torah, and therefore he created it based on it. Meaning that the Torah is the blueprint of the world. And there are two ways of complying with the Torah. One way as a righteous Noahide, one way as a righteous Jew. Now, until Matan Torah, until the uh, time of the uh, giving of the Torah, the uh, world was not obligated to follow it as a Jew because it wasn't formalized yet. Even though it existed and our Avot, our patriarchs, knew the Torah, and even actually a more extended version of the Torah that we even have today, um, they did not uh, follow the Torah per se like we do today because it wasn't formalized to the same extent. Um, so, and it wasn't a law yet, meaning it existed, but it wasn't, the, the on button wasn't put on for all of mankind. So from the time of Adama Rishon, the first human being that ever existed, uh, Hashem already gave these laws. Now, the, uh, first, uh, the first formalization was for Adam Rishon, he gave him six laws. And then to Noah, he gave him the seventh law, and therefore it's called the seven Noahide laws instead of the seven laws of Adam Rishon, because the, um, uh, anything is usually is called by the person that completes it. So the seven Noahide laws were implemented officially at the time of Noah after the Mabul, after the flood. Which means that Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov technically were considered Noahides, and they were not allowed to keep Shabbat uh, the same way that we keep today, because a, uh, the halacha is, is that a uh, non-Jew that observes Shabbat uh, is uh, it's death penalty, because it's considered as if they're stealing. So uh, the uh, sages explained to us that Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov kept Shabbat in a way because they knew the law and knew, the, you know, they... Uh, uh, they were the fathers of, of, of you know, Judaism that was going to come to the world. They kept it 99% similar to how a convert keeps it uh, until the time they actually officially convert. Now, the this all had to eventually get to the point of the climatic event of the world, which was Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, it became official to implement the second aspect of this Torah, and separate the Jews from the rest of the world. Until then, everyone was obligated to follow the Noahide laws. Of course, uh, most people did not. Most people were idolaters. But the, the, the righteous, the, uh, the uh, sons of Yaakov, followed the Noahide laws. But at the time of Mount Sinai, it, uh, something drastic happened. Uh, which formalized the law and obligated the sons of Yaakov, Bnei Israel, into becoming Jews, which means they had to now elevate themselves to a higher level by complying with much more laws that they didn't have to comply with until now, meaning Shabbat, kosher, uh, you know, Tarat Mishpacha, which is family purity, and so on and so forth. Uh, so at that time, that uh, at Parashat Itro, the the Parashat called Itro, which is the uh, uh, section of the Torah where we get the uh, the Torah, we got three things at Mount Sinai, and you see it in the verses where it says that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu received the Luchot, the, the Ten Commandments, the uh, Torah and the Mitzvot, meaning the written Torah and the oral Torah. So you got three things at Mount Sinai. You got the Ten Commandments. You got the um, uh, written Torah, and uh, which is what we have today, what we call the Chumash. Uh, and then we got also the oral law, because the oral law explains how to implement the written law. One cannot survive without the other. One depends on the other. There is no such thing as just the written law. There is no such thing as just the oral law. They go together. And anyway, usually the Christians and the uh, all the other heretics in the world 
usually try to go against the oral law because that's the one that obligates the written law. Uh, but anyway, at that moment, we uh, were uh, called the chosen people. Hashem says that he chose us to comply with this higher law. So until that moment, no one was obligated to comply with the uh, oral uh, law as far as the aspect of it, of the, you know, the mitzvot, kosher and things of that nature. And the, what ended up happening at Mount Sinai is that Hashem separated us from the rest of the nation. And he said, okay, you from now on have to comply with the entire Torah. The rest of mankind has to continue doing what they've been doing since since the creation of mankind. Since the creation of mankind. And actually one of the uh, obligations that the Jews have as far as bringing light to the world is by them complying with the law, that will also influence the, uh, the Gentiles around the world to also comply with the law. And uh, vice versa, part of the job of the Gentiles in the world is to help and influence the Jews to comply with the with the law as well with their part of the law now a uh so this is in essence the the culmination of events now if you fast forward from that moment until uh rabbi udanasi that you mentioned uh rabbi Udana, the the nasi means prince he was the head of, uh, of of israel what changed from that moment to then is that at Mount Sinai, we got a uh, written law and oral law. Oral law meaning that we uh, were transferring it from generation to generation, from father to son, father to son, from rabbi to student, and so on and so forth. We weren't allowed to write all of the details. We're all, you know, at that time, we uh, had the wisdom and the ability to remember all of it. Um, and But since there was the... Uh, downshift of uh, humanity specifically with uh, within uh, Am Yisrael as well Rabbi Yudanasi saw that we weren't able to remember it in the details that we were able to remember it in the past and therefore the uh, he implemented the uh, the power instilled in him and the sages by Hashem in the written law in the Torah which is to put a fence around the fence and also to protect the Torah and he actually wrote down parts of the oral law he didn't write all of the oral law down because that would literally consume every single piece of paper that ever existed from the beginning of mankind to the end of mankind. But he wrote the foundation. He wrote the foundation that explains how to fulfill this written law, how to fulfill this Torah. Uh, so he didn't change anything. He didn't add anything. Uh, what he did is that he wrote the foundation of it, which was called the Mishnah. Okay, and from there, several generations later, the sages saw that again the new generation is deteriorating either fur even further and is not able to understand completely the mishnah this oral law because the mishnah was written in a very very simplistic in a um, very very minimalized uh way the least amount of words but they had the wisdom at that time to understand the 50 million you know uh roots that go from it they at that point they started seeing that some people are not able to understand it so they elaborated it by show by writing the gemara the gemara is what explains what the mishnah is actually saying but also how they got to it and how all of the other opinions that you would think uh by you know, rationalizing it are wrong so it's not just about telling you what to do but how to understand what to do even you know in order to implement this same law in other ways uh, that are applicable and that's the Gemara later on they fast forward some more generations and we get to the uh, time of the Rambam the Rambam which is about 900 years ago somewhere around six seven hundred years after the Gemara was put together the Rambam saw that many people are not able to comprehend the uh, Gemara to the extent of actually knowing what to do you know they under they can read it but they don't know okay what's the bottom line so he simplified it and he took out all of the mitzvot the yes no yes no yes no yes no across the entire torah which actually also includes the noahide laws uh and everything else mar includes noahide laws the mishnah includes everything include always included the whole torah both the for the jews and for the non-jews and the rambam just took out the yes no's yes do this don't do this yes do this don't do this and what's called the mishneh torah or yad chazaka or the Rambam it's called three names called after his name Rambam uh, and uh, he pretty much simplified it 
fast forward a uh, again without removing anything but just simplifying it to accommodate the generation that we have then you fast forward it again another 400 years about 500 years ago Rabbi Yosef Karo uh, took it and narrowed it down even further again not uh, not a uh, removing anything but by simplifying it even further and also applying it to the times applying it to the times and he made something called Shuchan Aruch there was also another sage called Rama that also did it so there's Shuchan Aruch uh, was one aspect is the Rama added commentary to the Shuchan Aruch uh, but uh, point being is is that we have our tradition from today from the rabbis you have today all the way to Moshe Rabbeinu we know exactly every single person that you know uh, taught to Torah delivered it to the next generation what he said what he didn't say where did he get it from what is it all based off and when you learn the Gemara or the Mishnah or any of the commentary in the Midrashim you're always going to find that there has to be a verse from the written Torah that it's based off of or from the oral tradition called Moshe Sinai, meaning that Moses got it from Mount Sinai. But in general, the overwhelming majority of things have to have a verse in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, not in the prophets, not in the writings, but in the five books of Moses. We don't make halacha based on the uh, Psalms or Proverbs. We learn things from them, but we don't make the laws from there. The laws are only from the five books of Moses uh, and the five books of Moses alone. And um, here we see that every time they mention something, yes or no, to do something, then they have to get that from understanding from somewhere, that teaching from somewhere. Where is the actual original source? And they provide the source and explain exactly how they got to it and so on and so forth. So again the uh, the noahides in essence their job in the world hasn't changed uh, at all from the beginning of mankind nothing has changed for them the only thing that i would say has uh increased their ability to increase merit is that there's a much greater need for them to influence uh am israel to fulfill the torah today than there oh, ever was before which is a uh, extraordinary extraordinary job to do because that can give the noahide uh you know the status of uh you know being a giant in olam uh some examples of it for example that are in the torah again we have to always have a source one example of it is job job was a noahide he was a noahide and he was also a prophet he spoke to hashem but yet he's one of the foundational teachers that we have in our Tanakh even though he was a Noahide he was a righteous Noahide now this responsibility that the Noahides have which is a twofold responsibility one is to comply with the law and the second aspect of it is to influence Ami said to comply with the law is an enormous responsibility uh, that if they fulfill they have a uh, share of the world to come uh, that is uh, as extraordinary as it gets the problem today is that people are constantly forcing themselves to compare everything to what they know. So they know, let's say, for example, Christianity or a little Judaism or a little bit of a few different things. And uh, what ends up happening is that they try to reinvent the wheel, if you will. By that, I mean reinventing the wheel by they're trying to make the uh you know certain procedures or certain a uh, ways to show their beliefs in an exterior way uh you know certain they start to create customs and they add to what was actually the responsibility what's written in the Torah and that is problematic and the reason why is because if you're just adding something simplistic like for example you decide that you want to get together with your family every week uh seven days a week once a week three times a week doesn't make a difference to learn to learn the torah and to learn your obligations there's no problem with it but if you decide that no this uh, we're going to decide that from now on uh every uh, i don't know let's say every uh june 1st 
we're going to celebrate the, uh, you know, the, the uh, Noahide uh, day or something like that. That's a serious problem. Why? Because that, according to the Rambam, which means according to the Gemara, which means according to the Mishnah, which means according to the R written in, in oral Torah, that means that you are adding and therefore changing the Torah, which means that the person is now creating a new religion. Why? Because the religion itself, the creative religion itself is Judaism, is, uh, is, is the uh, aspect of the Jews, and Noahide is the, uh, is the status for the rest of the Gentiles. By taking parts of the Torah and then adding to them, adding a holiday, adding a certain things that's not written in there, they're now creating a new religion because it's not the same thing. It is something added. Once it's added, it's a completely different, uh, different uh, thing. You know, it's like saying, oh, wait, no, it's only just a little small addition. No, no, it's not a small addition. It's like, for example, if a uh, person uh, makes a uh, juice, he decides to make a juice, a bunch of uh, oranges, and, uh, you know, and he uh, makes a nice orange juice. And then his friend says, yeah, no, this is good orange juice. But uh, let's put a little bit of uh, rum in there. Let's put a little bit of rum in there. It's still orange juice. No, my friend, it's not orange juice. It's now an alcoholic beverage. It's now an alcoholic beverage that is not, that tastes like orange juice, but it's not orange juice. It's an alcoholic beverage. So once a person starts adding things that are not part of the Noahide laws, they're creating a new religion, which is a you know, horrible, horrible sin uh you know so that's a very serious problem with many of the people that are uh simply guiding themselves uh and not in accordance to the torah because they want to in essence live like uh, a, a jewish life with the ceremonies and things of that nature but don't necessarily want or can't or whatever the case may be actually formally convert and keep everything uh and that is a very serious problem because now they're taking the Torah that they're obligated to follow all the way from the time of Adam Alishon, and they're now distorting it, playing with it, manipulating it, adding things that they, their own opinion. Now, the Rambam, which all of the uh, religions, all of the people that know who he is, know he's one of the greatest human beings that ever lived, said the following. He said that a uh, righteous Noahide or Noahide that follows the laws of Noah, follows the, uh, the the laws in the Torah according to, to uh, uh, in, as far as the Gentile laws. If he follows the Noahide laws, because it makes sense to him, not because it God said it, not because it's written, not because it's an obligation, but rather because it makes sense to him not to kill. It makes sense to him not to eat an animal while it's still alive. It makes sense to him not to worship a statue or a man. It makes sense to him not to, uh, uh, you know, commit adultery. It makes sense to him to, to, do, to not do all those things and comply. The Rambam specifically says not only does he not get a share of the world to come, but he's actually considered one of the biggest fools in the world. He's considered, in his language, one of the fools of the of the nations, not one of the uh, uh, wise of the nations or the righteous of the nations. Why? Because he's doing all the work, but he's not going to get a single reward for it. Why? Because the reason why you follow, you have to follow the Torah, whether Jew or Gentile, is simply because God said so. Not because you like it, not because you don't like it, not because you agree with it or disagree with it, but simply because God said so. That's the reason to do all of it. Uh, so when a person follows the law based on God said so, he's considered special. He's considered wise. He's considered amazing. Why? Because once the same Rambam says, if the uh, Noahide follows the laws of Noah because God said it, not only is he considered one of the righteous uh, and, and wise among the nations, but also he is actually has a share of the world to come which is written in the prophets, you'll see that uh, at the end of days, uh, one out of every uh, one of the nation, 10 out of every one of the uh, 70 nations will come to the Jews, that are righteous Jews, that have done tshuva, that are, uh, you know, that are righteous and follow the Torah, and 10 from each nation will come and uh, ask them, you know, oh, our forefathers have lied to us, and uh, please, you know, teach us. And every Jew that wears a tzitzit will have 
2,800 righteous Noahides to teach as a student because they earn their spot. Why do they earn their spot? By again, fulfilling their twofold obligation. One obligation is to fulfill the Torah that's according to that's uh, that's applicable to them, the Noahide laws, and two is that a uh, they're uh, fulfilling the Torah as far as helping Jews fulfill their aspect of the Torah because they're eventually going to become their teachers. They're 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 the chosen that's supposed to be their teachers. So what are the Noahide laws? Noahide laws are not only seven. They're not only seven. This is also another confused thing. It's not only seven things. There's somewhere around maybe 60 laws. I don't remember the number off the top of my head. It's almost around 60 laws, but they're all generally moral laws that break off of the seven, similar to how the Ten Commandments breaks off into 613 commandments. You know, the Ten Commandments are not separate from the 613 laws. It's in essence the same thing. It's in essence the same thing, but it's, let's say, for example, there is the uh, tree and then there's all of the roots. Same thing with the seven laws of Noah. Seven laws of Noah are all moral laws that every normal human being, if he thinks about it, would arrive at the same conclusion anyway. But it's a formalization of that law. You have to follow it because God said so. And therefore, a uh, person that uh, learns to be a righteous Noahide will spend an enormous amount of time learning both the written Torah, the written Torah, which is the Chumash, the Tanakh, with the commentary from the Jewish sages like Rashi, Rambam, Ramban, and so on. That part, and they will learn Musar. Why Musar? Because Musar is ethical laws that are applicable to all of mankind. Applicable to all of mankind. If a person truly wants to do the will of Hashem and learn, they'll learn this, and they'll realize that there's so many things that a person needs to fix when it comes to ethics, that there's no time for them to play around with the Torah and try to add some extra thing to it. Why? Because they're not even doing the minimum requirement as it is if they're not learning it. So the point is, is that there is a uh, moral laws that both Jews and Gentiles need to comply with that they have in common, and they're both taught in the teachings of Musa. So with that being said, a you know this gives a lot of work to anyone that wants to be a righteous Noahide, uh, because now we, they see that they don't need necessarily a uh, special uh, holiday to, uh, to, to serve Hashem. They're obligated to do it every day. Every day is a holiday. Uh, they don't need a uh, special uh, food to, uh, to, uh, you know, to, to serve Hashem. Every day the food is special. Every day. Why? Because every day they're supposed to eat food that meets certain requirements, meaning that it's not an animal that uh, is uh, still alive it's a uh, uh, there's ethical ethics behind it it's you know again it's a, even even the things that a person does it's not just a uh, the way they talk the way they behave needs to be ethical so point being is that a person that wants to uh be a righteous noahide uh has to or a righteous jew has to review what is the ethics in accordance to the torah meaning in accordance with the shem and when a person does that, he has his work cut out for him. She has her work cut out for her with a lot of work, with a lot of learning, and Rezat Hashem, uh, a lot of success to follow. Uh, hopefully this gives uh, you a, a good understanding of what uh, what it means to be a righteous Noahide. Again, the, uh, the amount of uh, Musar that a person needs to learn in their life, just to give you a small, tiny example, Rabbi Yosef Karo, uh, the one that wrote the Shulchan Aruch, he, uh, he had a uh, separate book called Magid Yesharim, where it was like, in essence, like a journal uh, that he wrote about what, would, what happened, you know, what was the conversations between him and his study buddy. Who was his study buddy? A, uh, an angel. An angel would study with him. And one day he writes that the angel rebuked him harshly. Why? He says, how come you didn't study more Musar today? Not that he didn't study Musar. He studied a few hours of Musar every day. He said, how come you didn't study enough today? He rebuked him harshly. If Rabbi Yosef Karo that was at such a high level to be able to have the merit to study with an angel, if he was rebuked for only studying a few hours of Musar for that day, needless to say, your average Jew 
or your average Gentile that's trying to be righteous Noahide, how much Musa do they need to listen to and, and, and learn and implement and so on? So the point being is that when a person really sees how much obligation they have based on the minimum requirement of a Jew or a Gentile, they simply will find themselves in a position where they do not have an interest or an inclination or even the time to add any of their own opinion uh, or any of their own anything to it because first you have to fulfill the obligation and then you go for the extras you know first you have to pay the rent or the mortgage then you start worrying about your savings account you don't worry about a savings account until you pay the the basic requirements to live even more so when it comes to talk first you fulfill the basic minimum of being a jew basic minimum of being a gentile a righteous noahide then you worry about other things and the reality is in our generation alvai we wish everybody just simply did the minimum we wish that they just did the minimum because the minimum requires people to connect to hashem to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu every day, all day, all the time, in every way, every shape or form, whether they're a Jew or a Gentile. That's minimum. Minimum. Just if we do that already, already that puts us at a different level than most people in the world. So hopefully this gives everybody a rundown of what's the responsibility. Please feel free to ask any more questions, details, and so on. Uh, and again, thank you again for learning with me. Call to Vatzlachah